Hi everyone, today I'm going to cover the massive landslide in the area of Rancho Palos Verdes, California. This is in Southern California. According to the mayor of this city, it's the largest active landslide currently ongoing in the United States, uh, in the continental U.S. that is, and it's, it's just massive. Now stories like these fascinate me. If you're new to the channel, I'm an engineer. I'm licensed as both a professional geologist and a professional engineer in several states. So these stories are extremely interesting to me. So I'm going to break down what's going on, what are the root causes, and what's going to be done to perhaps remediate the situation, although I think they've got their work cut out for them here. And the other thing I want to cover is just the societal aspect uh, from a governing standpoint. When is it reasonable to keep pouring money into something that appears essentially as unsustainable. So I'll cover that as well. Now let's start with this evacuation area that was put out by city officials. This was as of August 31st, 2024. It's a large area. It encompasses approximately 450 to 500 homes. So let's look at this geological map. So here's where we're located, this area here that's in gray. It's, it's classified as quaternary landslide deposits. So material that's moved in the last 10,000 years. So just to give you an idea of where we are in Southern California, here's a, a Google map. And then here's a Google Earth image. We'll zoom out. Just give you a perspective where this is, basically west of Long Beach. And you can see from this footage, there's been significant movement. In fact, this landslide overall is moving at a rate of three to four feet a month or 50 feet a year, which is astounding. You can see this individual's driveway is about 10 feet above the roadway now, maybe 20 feet actually. You see these scarps, these large cracks forming. Quite a large area, essentially a mile long and a mile wide. Now this map shows the rate of movement. The green is where the movement slowed down, and that is the shallower landslide material. And the material shown here in red is the deeper landslide material it's part of an ancient landslide that up until now hadn't been moving. So it's recently been reactivated. There's also areas where the landslide toe is pushed out into the sea approximately 500 feet, although they are getting ready to do underwater measurements to determine exactly how far that toe extends from the shoreline. So you can see this material here. For reference, this point of land here is called Inspiration Point. And you can see the debris from the, the toe of the landslide moving out offshore. So back in 2017, the city officials initiated some remediation work. They refer to these as hydrogers. It's the installation of two horizontally drilled dewatering wells to extract water underground in the Portuguese Bend landslide. Now the Portuguese Bend landslide is a smaller landslide area as part of this overall Altamira slide complex, the ancient landslide. So they decided they needed more borings to determine where they should best put these horizontal drains because it was a buildup of water, groundwater, that was creating excess pore water pressures that was the initiation for these slides. And in fact, that's what's causing them to perpetuate. And what they found was the area that they were getting ready to remediate, the upper slide was at a depth of 165 feet, but this much deeper, uh, more ancient slide is at a depth of 330 feet. So for my research, this landslide movement, at least the upper one, goes back to 1956 when government officials were doing roadway work along Crenshaw, uh, the extension of Crenshaw. And uh, just from what I gather, they probably cut the toe off a portion of the slope. And once you do that and get movement, uh, it can go on for, for a very, very long time. And then once these cracks open up, they're prone to filling with water from, from rainfall or other water leaks in the area, as particularly if uh, utilities are ruptured, and it just further propels the movement of the slope. Now, these horizontal drains that they were planning to put in cost about $5 million each. And to put that in perspective, the overall city budget's about $35 million a year. Here's a close-up of this landslide cross-section. So they realized they needed to do more borings. They're planning to do a different type of remediation, and that is through basically dewatering wells, vertical wells. 
So they want to do these additional nine borings to make sure that they're adequately characterizing where the high pore water pressures are located to so make sure they go deep enough for these relief wells. And they're studying this here over about the next month. They're trying to decide, should they use smaller casing? They're cheaper to install. And when they shear off from continued movement, they could essentially re-drill or ream that smaller casing out. Or should they go in with more expensive, larger diameter casing? And then once you do that, you may be maxed out on the size that you could use to enlarge such a well. So kind of a one and done scenario. And then if once it shears off, you have to replace it altogether. So they're conducting this subsurface investigation as we speak. And this isn't really happening quick enough for the homeowners. And uh, I feel for them. You know, it's... Uh, it's a sad situation. You know, a number of these people have had their electrical power cut off. They've had their gas cut off. I think uh, upwards of 100 people have had their gas cut off. And now around 200 people have had their power cut off. It's uh, uncertain right now how long those outages will continue. The electricity has been turned off for fear of a spark causing a wildfire. So presumably once they're out of the fire season, then perhaps some of these people can get their power restored. But that's uh, really up in the air at this point. You can see they have some above ground utilities. I believe these are sewer lines and they've had leaks of these due to slope movement and rupture. In one recent incident, there was 10,000 gallons of raw sewage that spilled out. Quite, quite the mess. So let's look at some of these areas right now that are currently impacted. You see this, this road section here. This is right in the middle of the most rapidly accelerating portion of the slide, which is a deeper seated slide at a depth of 330 feet. Now on August 20th, 2024, the city of Rancho Palos Verdes had a city council meeting and uh, they discussed the technical aspects of what was going on, what they plan to do, and then they had residents uh, speaking up about their concerns and questions about what's going on. So interestingly, the mayor of this city is an engineer and uh, you don't typically see government officials having engineering backgrounds. So it's appropriate here for him because he can relate to these technical aspects and communicate them uh, clearly to people who are affected by what's going on. Another thing that was of interest is he took some real shots at the, the governor of California, Newsom, for essentially not bothering to look into what's going on with the situation. And he also, the mayor commented that even the state geologist hasn't been to this city to see what's going on with this landslide. And I thought, wow, is this a, a Republican stronghold that uh, I didn't know about in Southern California? So I brought up this map. It's, it's all blue, as you might expect. You know, most of California is blue, at least the coastal areas in the southern tip of California. So I think the mayor is just extremely frustrated. This is a, a technical issue that can be addressed through gathering information, performing an evaluation, but most importantly, they need government funding, at least that's what they're asking for, to remedy this situation. So again, they're talking about these emergency installations of these horizontal drains in two different arrays. And then they're gonna go on to these uh, vertical wells here pretty soon, probably within the next month, month and a half. Now, what was mentioned at the city council meeting was that they're going to extend their moratorium on new construction in this landslide area. And I'm like, that hasn't happened a long time ago? That's, that's kind of shocking. So they're looking to extend it another 12 months, which only seems prudent. So to give you an idea, the average house price in this Rancho Palos Verdes area is $1.9 million. So one of the things I was wondering about is whether insurance would cover these losses. You know, there's already people who have had to leave their home and in all likelihood won't be able to come back. And it turns out, I'll just read this from a search that I did. And the question was, is home and business insurance coverage for landslides the same as for mud flow? And in essence, neither one is covered under a typical policy. A landslide is considered an earth movement event so like an earthquake, it is excluded from the standard homeowners and business insurance policies. However, you can buy what's known as a difference in conditions policy, which typically offers 
all-in-one coverage for landslides, mud flows, earthquakes, and floods. So how many of these 450 to 500 homeowners do you think had this extra insurance? I would bet very few of them do. But it also brings up a question, why are lenders loaning money for people to buy houses in this area? Now, I understand a lot of these houses were bought back in the 1960s, and people have lived there since then, and perhaps was unaware that, at least geologically speaking, their subdivision was right on top of a landslide. I mean, it's, it's mapped like that on the geologic map. Now, there are situations where people will consider those slides to be dormant and find out later they're not. It's sort of like living next to a volcano. Uh, take the people of Seattle living near Mount Rainier. Is uh, Mount Rainier dormant? It is for now, but it won't be in perpetuity. So this got me thinking, you know, the city officials have applied for funding to FEMA. They're looking for various flows of federal funding to remedy this situation. And, you know, aside from apparently government officials triggering this slide back in the 1950s, they've been involved with various remediation efforts. They've been involved with grounding. They've been involved with granting permits for people to build and, and live in homes here. So at what point do people say, this just isn't sustainable? We can't keep pouring hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars into a situation that isn't gonna last very long. And that reminds me of the situation with Hurricane Katrina and the resultant flooding back in 2005 in the city of New Orleans. I mean, it was a massive disaster. And you can see that at the time of Katrina, the population of New Orleans, the city of New Orleans was around 450,000. And then that dropped to just above 200,000 after all the evacuations. And it slowly climbed and now it's decreasing again, but it's around 350,000 people right now. So I remember at the time, some people were discussing, you know, does it make sense for the federal government in particular to be spending billions of dollars to rebuild levees, to put in other flood control measures, uh, to protect a city that's essentially 10 feet below sea level. And the few voices that brought that concern up were quickly shouted down and accused of uh, nasty motivations, but I think it was a fair policy point. I mean, how sustainable is living in a city near the coast of the United States that's 10 feet below sea level? And we've seen already that the flood control measures, because of political pressures, uh, money saving measures, you name it, failed miserably in 2005. So it was interesting to me at the city council meeting that you had affected homeowners deeply troubled by being put out of their house, not knowing when they could go back. I mean, I, I feel for these people. And then you have other interest groups. Uh, there's an individual who spoke up about the road closure to two-wheeled vehicles. So they closed about a two-mile stretch of roadway in the city because of cracking and, and other distress of the roadway. And this individual, although very respectfully, just said, hey, you know, we don't really think it's right that you just close the road to essentially motorcycles and bicycles, which is kind of interesting because, you know, I've covered the Teton Pass landslide and that landslide came to people's attention because a motorcyclist crashed on a large crack that opened up in the roadway. So I think time is against these people in this area of California in terms of being able to stabilize this slope. We're approaching the rainy season. It's gonna be highly likely that new rainfall this fall and winter is going to infiltrate these, these scarps, these open cracks that have opened up on this hillside that's subject to this landslide and just further accelerate movement. So I just don't see how they, they've got the time to implement any remediation measures before they're gonna be fighting the weather here. So let me know what you think in the comments section. I wanna send a shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate your ongoing support. Also, I'd like to send a shout out to those of you who've provided super thanks. I'm going to roll credits for both at the end of this video. I'm working on a lot of interesting stories and follow-ups on previous stories that I've done, so please stay tuned for future videos.